I'm Jay Horton, I make movies that make money, and this is Filmmakers On. Today, I'm talking to filmmaker and CEO of Hex Studios, Lowry Brewster. During the interview, he shares his fundraising, marketing, and distribution tips that have led him to build a pretty impressive little empire across the pond. And I think we may have fell in love just a little bit. Let's do the interview thing. Lori, uh, Lori, Lori, Lori. Okay, Lori. Um, tell me. Let's let's start off. Let's kind of start off at the end. Um, what is uh, Hex Studios? Well, Hex Studios is a boutique genre studio. We operate from a two hundred year old church, which is being refurbished as a as, as a, a gothic film studio. Uh, wow. We produce about three films a year at the moment, but that has grown over the years. So we started out with one film a year and then two and then three where we are right now. It's a company that's been going on for about eight years, I think. And we try to operate with a vertical structure, as they call it, which is to say uh, <laughs> we finance, produce and, and distribute films uh, yeah. as much as we can internally, which is a very unusual business model. It's not to say, though, that we don't work with other partners. We do. But that's just our main concentration. And it's made our operation, I guess, quite unique, really, compared to the conventional business models that most independent film producers or, or you know, companies follow. I think most uh, most filmmakers, you know, they try to go that traditional route. They make their movie. They try to give it to a distributor. They try to get somebody else to finance it. Like they just basically want to make the movie. Sounds like you guys are like, you know, top to bottom. You're taking charge of everything. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a very different approach. Um, as a freelance producer before working with Hex, you know, and, and, and still I'll sometimes do the odd gig. Um, you know, I'll work with distributors. I would be involved in negotiating deals and things like that. And well, you know where the bottom line is if you're working with them, right? So it's like, yeah. <laughs> so it's like yeah, maybe maybe I'll try this. <laughs> yeah, you can get lucky sometimes, but yeah, for the most part. <laughs> oh, for sure. So we make films. Uh, we also produce merchandise for mm. our films as well. So. A big deal for us is intellectual property, and that mostly focuses around the antagonists of our horror films. So if we are lucky enough to have a villain that is quite popular, like our character, the Owl Man, <laughs> which is a bit <laughs> like a kind of Slender Man-esque character, but with an owl head, that has actually been as commercially successful for us as our films, if not more so. So we're always keen to look at ways we can monetize our intellectual property and our stories beyond just the films but it's also because as creatives uh, we enjoy making films first and foremost but we also enjoy all the other ideas like for example books or or t-shirts and garments or even um action figures and dolls and things like that which we've had sold as well yeah and, and of course you you know you want to eat and you know with the uh, exhibition income kind of is getting lower over the years. So it's like we have to start seeking out additional avenues to monetize our projects. Yeah, I sometimes think that the, the, the future for sustainable independent film for a lot of artists might almost be a kind of weird quasi kind of Etsy model, but hopefully a lot more sophisticated, you know, right. where they're almost like cottage industries. Um, but at least that's been what it's been like for us and we've been successful in that way and not as successful with conventional uh, methods. You know, we'll sometimes adopt those as complementary things to what we're doing ourselves and we're never blown away by the results, you know? Yeah, that sounds really similar to my experience. I mean, I, I started out the first half of my career, mostly traditional. Um, you know, some, some did okay, some did well. But, you know, it was when I actually took control and I started, you know, basically vertical integrating, uh, similar to what you're doing, that I saw uh, more uh, consistent success. There's something, and this, this might sound a little eccentric, but there's mm. something quite romantic about the idea of setting up a, a studio with inspirations, influences from the, the first wave of film studios. 
Um, when I think of like Metro Golden Mayor and on all those kind of things, or even British um, genre studios like Hammer, for example, mm -hmm. or Amicus, there's something kind of quite fun about that. Whereas only being a producer or a production company and then throwing your film into an arena of distribution companies and aggregators, it's, it's lost to the ether, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas just building up this your own creative institution, which is what it's like when you build your own studio. Um, there's there's something quite fun and nostalgic and rewarding about that. But that's again that that's just a personal thing. But let's let's take it back. So how how did you uh, start out? What happened originally? Uh, so we, we go back a lot, a good good few years ago um, when I was a young and beautiful man. Um, <laughs> I was doing uh, like commercials and things um, mm -hmm. to, to, to pay the bills and um, I, had, I had wanted to do creative projects but maybe like a, quite a lot of people in in the US as well if you didn't happen to live near the centers of creative industry you would start to drift away from that as being perhaps an impossible dream and you, you become more pragmatic you know like, what can I film well I guess I can make an advert for a tire factory you know it's like and you can get caught up in that you know yeah and I was for for a while that, that was like during uh, my 20s it just so happened that I met a really gorgeous girl who was very creatively ambitious and there was no way I was going to impress this young lady by making tire adverts um, <laughs> was that Sarah Daly <laughs> yeah that's what Oh yeah, yeah, that would be really bad if it wasn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would, she said, I would no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, there goes my computer. So uh, Sarah Daly is 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 my my business partner and my romantic partner in life as well. Mm -hmm. Now, she was doing an office job and living in another country. She was in Ireland. I was amazed though at the kind of scripts and and writing and creativity that she was producing. She was sending me stuff. And yes, of course, she looked really cute. And I was pestering her on a, and at the time, a filmmaking forum, um, saying, you know, hey, hi. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> but I, I took some of her scripts and started to produce them into short films um, as a way of, I guess, one, one cheesy reason would be to try and impress her, and another because it had awoken the creative instinct in me that I'd yeah. kind of, you know, suppressed. Um, Sometimes they go hand in hand. Exactly. Um, and, you know, it, it was cool. Um, and over, it took a while because you know, we corresponded for a while, but eventually, um, you know, we would date and we would go out and and, and then live together. And that, that was great. And it was all based on this idea that we should work together um, and, as creative collaborators. Mm. Now, we hadn't started Hex yet, um, that would come quite soon. But it was through that collaboration, though, that my first big breaks occurred in the creative industries. Um, I'll give you an example, of just, just one yep. example. You know, we're sitting having dinner and the phone rings and it's a cold call. But it's a cold call from Joseph Gordon-Levitt, you know, from like 500 Days of Summer and stuff like that. And he's like, um, I read one of Sarah's scripts on, on a website. Can I make it into a short film? You know, wow. so I could show it in Sundance. And <laughs> I was like, uh, wow, how did you do that, Sarah? It's like, you know, it's just it was just on there. We shouldn't have an agent or anything like that pushing that. In a quite a short space of time, um, we had uh, short films that we produced in collaboration. I mean, I'm I'm in the short film with Joe Scorn Levitt, I did the art direction, editing, VFX, wow. all that stuff, whilst she was doing the scripts. Um we did that with him. We did that with Channing Tatum as well. It showed at Sundance. We had one show at South the Southwest, and we had Robert Redford watch um, our film. He really liked it, and um, a successive, <laughs> a succession, should I say, of, of celebrities wanted Sarah to produce stuff for them uh, or, or write things for them. So mm -hmm. she had like Gary Oldman perform her stuff in the Ellie Orpheum Theatre, or Anne Hathaway, Anna Kendricks, and and even you know that. That pop singer Sia with the blonde yeah. hair in front of her yeah, face. Yeah, yeah, I, li I like her quite a bit. Right. Well, she covered one of Sarah's songs in concert as well, wow. as as a dedication to Sarah, and and put out a tweet to her like apologizing if she didn't get her song right. You know, like, <laughs> and this was a girl that was perhaps about, oh, about just a year before was 
transcribing airline manuals in an office, you know? Right. From that, we were like, right, you know, we should take the creative stuff further because, you know, it's, it's quite a strong vote of confidence that Sarah's getting as well. Mm -hmm. But to produce a feature film was still a challenge because my experience at the time was in the corporate field and making a feature film felt like a mile, mile, mile apart. I mean... Right. Now, at this time, uh, making the shorts, were, were you able to, to monetize? No, nah, this is like, um, I mean, we're, we're talking like 10, 11 years ago, maybe a little bit longer actually, but about that. Making a short film culturally here, like where I am in this kind of like blue collar part of Scotland, Mm -hmm. It would be seen as like a kind of like an arty farty endeavor, almost akin to like street theater or something. And you do it and then you'd put your head down and go back to work and do something proper before you embarrass yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so, I'm from the Midwest in the US. We have a similar uh, mindset or we did. <laughs> right. So um, but what the actual fe first feature film, the way it did come about was we had um, in 2010, a big snow. It was a, just a giant snow. It knocked everything out for like three months or something. You couldn't do anything. And me, Sarah, and some friends, we went out and we just did a film. It was very spontaneous. It involved quite a lot of improvisational stuff. It's, it wasn't a hex film, but it was just this like micro budget thing called Whiteout, which um, you can't see commercially at all. It's, <laughs> um, but like, um, it is. As a, a monument to my shame, it's uh, still on my YouTube channel, so it can be enjoyed there. I'm, I'm being too hard on it, actually. But um, what happened with that, when we did it, I didn't know what the hell to do with it. I didn't, mm -hmm. I'd never been to film markets, never done anything like that. I basically ended up getting, a, a, I remember at the time, a bus from Scotland to Pinewood Studios. That was a long trip. Wow. Basically, me with lots of uh, foreign construction workers made a long journey and... <laughs> And I basically shopped it door to door. Now, Pinewood Studios isn't a film market at all, you mm. know, but I just didn't know any better, really. Um, but by the end of it, I had managed to make a deal, uh, which I hadn't done before, but the commercial experience I had, it, it, it landed us about something like $55,000 within like six months, mm -hmm. which is a, pretty yeah. much a, a miracle, really, because the film is, you see it, it's, you know, it's... It's like um, the way financially that was able to pay out, some of that was advances and a lot of that was tax kickbacks. You know, Britain relies a lot on film subsidies. So when I say $55,000, I don't want to create in the minds of the viewer the idea that that was just a straight sales deal. Um, right. Because with the way you make money in British film, it's just that bit more complicated because our industry isn't as successful commercially. And so there's more subsidy. So you have to kind of plan for that a bit. And anyway, that's, that's what happened. But suddenly uh, we had more money than we'd ever had before. It was like a windfall, you know? Yeah. We put that cash into setting up uh, Hex Studios. It's also known as Hex Media, as a, but its trading name is Hex Studios, yeah. And that's when we did our first horror film, Lord of Tears. And uh, that was a, a film shot over 13 days and it had a very small budget. It was only like maybe $25,000 or something like that. Because, you know, yeah. we only had so much money. Um, right. And you were still kind of drawing from that 50,000 windfall? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Trying not to, like, spend it all on booze and sweeties, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Didn't go out and get a new car. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you know, they say that... Oh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> they say that copper wire was the invention of two Scotsmen fighting over a coin. So, <laughs> so, so that, that legend is true. We don't tend to spend our money. Well, <laughs> says the guy with like gold to cow plaster behind him. But yeah, you know. <laughs> right. But so Lord of Tears uh, was, was good. But here's the thing, right? We started shooting Lord, we shot Lord of Tears and then we started shooting The Unkindness of Ravens and we started spending most of that money. The deal that we had for Whiteout, which had paid out, the same mechanism, the setup that we thought we had, kind of like a slate deal, fell apart. Gone, poof. And suddenly, 
you've you've got this movie in the can and you've got half a movie in the can and you've got like no cash and no idea how the hell you're going to get cash in a short mm. space of time and that that's at the time why we turned to kickstarter and that would be transformative the thing as well with the transformative experience we had on kickstarter is that yeah the our ability to monetize that platform unexpectedly um, was informed by our experiences in the like commercial gig sector you know when you know yourself when yeah. you do that work you just think differently you can get deals you can be a bit more entrepreneurial than just being an artist you, you need both so with the, the lord of tears kickstarter we never approached it as just a, a campaign to raise money to finish a film it was used more like a retail pre-order campaign for mm. these products that we put a lot of work into um and it felt like a catalog really that you were ordering products from when you went to our page the first campaign on on the face of it right wouldn't look that impressive financially a lord of tears raised i think something like about $18,000 but i did that in 25 days and we'd never used it before that's respectable i mean i i know a lot of filmmakers that don't that they, they fall way short of that but but here's the here's the thing though during that time the publicity for the campaign attracted the interest of high net worth equity individuals um and from the course of that i closed slate deals worth for hex about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. wow and that was the game changer a lot of that money came from the united arab emirates and um, my experiences would change quite a bit in fact so that i would end up making friends mostly with high net worth equity individuals you know rather than like through getting finance from say a distribution company like pre-sale or anything like that right that was like a miracle that was like wow holy you know don't want to swear on your show but you get oh, that no, it's fine <laughs> so that would provide finance for a number of films such as the rest of the money required for the unkindness of ravens uh, the mm -hmm. black gloves and the devil's machine each of those films as well would have their own crowdfunding campaigns but used ostensibly as pre-order product sales you know mm -hmm. so for example we went from like say like the eighteen thousand or, or for lord of tears it then became like maybe sixty five thousand dollars for ravens and then ninety thousand for the black gloves and one hundred thirty thousand for the devil's machine wow. um you know, so each one's kind of progressively. And then we started to do additional films which weren't directed by myself. So, for example, we did an anthology feature film called Four We Are Many, mm -hmm. okay, 13 horror shorts you know, with a wraparound. And Ed had raised about $55,000, uh, which was great because then you, you realise it didn't just have to be my ass in the director's chair every single time this works. Because also we were, you know, wanted to be a studio rather than just the... Laurie show absolutely that takes us more or less to the point when we started to um, get the money from sales of products we also found that our character the owl man was very popular from lord mm -hmm. of tears he appeared in a youtube video which went viral and in a number of viral videos which were originally made to promote the kickstarter and the film um mm -hmm. they're like prank videos but with the antagonists scaring people oh cool yeah, I mean, they've netted over like 50 million views on YouTube. And it, to be honest, actually, when it first went viral, that was after the, the Kickstarter was done and we had the product for sale just like on a website. And when it went viral with the link, you would go into your inbox and you would see from like Shopify, an order has been made. And suddenly it was like the whole page. And I was like, oh my God, I had to go like through eight pages. Like, order, 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 order. Like, <laughs> We must have made like about fifteen thousand dollars in like eight days from when that went viral. It went like to four million views in this, the course of like ten days or something in the first video. And That's insane. Yeah, I will say though, um, whatever link mechanism with the YouTube then, which was at two thousand fourteen, doesn't work like that now. Uh, no. We've had we've had shop links on videos that have gone more viral than that, and they've not produced those kinds of returns but in any case it did then and you know now i mean geez like that l man character um we've sold action figures based on them based on the old um 
Kenner Star Wars figures from like the 70s and 80s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've also licensed, uh, we do licensing with the IP. So the Owlman is also available as a an adult collectible doll. That sounds weird. Not like yeah. a. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> not, not, it's not a sex thing. Adult doll. <laughs> <laughs> market you need to break into, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's available with Mezco toys. So they produce like action figures for like all the Star Wars, Marvel heroes and stuff like that. But, mm -hmm. um, but Mezco, they're one of the, the biggest US toy manufacturers. We're just like, yeah, we just love this. Um, it just happened that their CEO really liked the character. So their art team got to work and it's like a totally amazing, like beautiful figure. The the revenues from that have been competitive compared to film. Right. Um, and so every time we make films, we're always thinking of IP. So anyway, mm. all this combined meant that we had enough cash to then buy a church. Oh, you actually, you purchased it. Like you're not renting it. You're not leasing it. You, you purchased the church. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That is so. It's so cool. To, I mean, I, I'm I'm a big believer in owning uh, real estate, so that's that's great. You know, um, where we are, property is more affordable, and it just felt like a no brainer because literally mm -hmm. where I live, the the church is a five minute walk straight down the street. Um, so it just felt like fate, you know. The thing is, though, we're looking at acquiring a second property, and at the moment, we're in negotiations with the Scottish government because this would be a private public partnership okay. and if that went ahead it would see us acquiring a much larger building a building that's a former Victorian theatre um, so it's you know it's it's big um, and historic as well and sounds like aesthetics are really important to you like where you're where you're working you want your working environment to feel like a good creative space yes well you can tell I'm a bit theatrical I mean this is my my study here you know, oh, nice. go, go along. It's like, I can't stop. It's like, oh, yeah. It's just, I've always, we've always loved, um, I mean, we all love history here and and uh, we're all kind of romantics and, you know, gothic qualities as well are, are big things. And Scotland is full of, well, gothic architecture. Like the church is gothic. The Victorian theatre building that we're hoping to, to, to get is gothic as well. It's also inspiring, though, for our collaborators and even our investors. Oh, yeah. People want to be a part of that, right? Like they want to work with you. Like they see that kind of stuff. Sure. Because if you see, if you're telling people that you're making a movie and you're trying to raise money for the film, that's the film. But mm -hmm. there's a bigger sell you can do than that. If you're looking to build something like a studio or an institution, you can say, yeah, you can invest in a film. But why not invest in a long-term partnership to create something of the likes that has stood the test of time, like a famous film studio? Um, yeah. Which within the genre, there's, you know, in Britain, there's studios like Hammer, for example, you know, things like that. There's nostalgic references that you can draw on for investors that can make it accessible and understandable. And it can be more fun feeling like mm -hmm. you're part of a studio or a studio boss than just an associate producer, say, for example. With our investors um, and sometimes patrons as well, to be honest, we do get patronage. Um, this sounds utterly cheesy, but yeah, uh, especially for my my my, my, my Scottish Scottish struggles <laughs> with this kind of thing. I, but like there are there are some folks that think I'm such a creative genius that they just want to help Jason. Yes, <laughs> of course, of course. Um, we were very lucky very very lucky um to have uh someone help us update our equipment you know we we were operating with um a pretty aged uh c300 mark one um mm -hmm. and we were effectively donated a c300 mark three um the, the new camera and it was just like thank you <laughs> yeah totally so a lot of that is based on us producing projects that we're passionate about, but also finding investors that are passionate about not just the project, but the artistic direction of the company. So they, they actually feel like, or not so much feel like, but they understand that what they're actually funding is a, a kind of cultural mission statement, you know, mm -hmm. something that, that transcends an immediate project, like just a film, something bigger. That's, that's smart. 
Um, and I know a lot of people are watching this and they're out there thinking um, or they're wanting to know, like, how are you attracting your investors? Are you seeking them out? Are they coming to you? Is it, did it kind of just build organically from the Kickstarter? How did that work? I'll, I'll just add as a, as a quick caveat before I say about the investors sure. is that we do also take money now more recently from distribution companies that are uh, co-financing films. For example, mm. um, our latest film, Dragon Knight, is half financed by Hex and half by a uh, big UK distribution company, High Flyers. And okay. it's a you know fantasy sword and sorcery film that has to have, of course, a 3D dragon. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we are diversifying that as well. Um, because one thing you, you'll know uh, anyway is that it's important to have multiple revenue streams, mm -hmm. you know, and also because we want to keep making bigger films as well as more films. And so there's, there's a point with the kind of investors we speak to that we're like, we know the level they're comfortable at. You never want to try and take your investors to the dry clean, the cleaners or whatever, anything like that. You've you got to be responsible with them. And, and so then you need other people to come in. But for, we were lucky with our lower budget projects, which were like $150,000 from the higher end of, of things-ish, you know, maybe a mm -hmm. bit higher than that for like the devil's machine and stuff like that. But for bigger budgets, you definitely want investors and companies, I would say. But for anyway, for the investors, um, a lot of them would come to me, but that wasn't through lack of effort on my part, though, to try and get the word out. Like, for example, you look at executive producers for projects and then you think, right, these are exec producers and projects that perhaps are like ours. You know, mm -hmm. you know, let's say hi to them and let them know what we're doing. That has a win-loss ratio that, you know, is, is yeah. fairly harmless. Yeah, but, but yeah, you, know, you, you do that. Um, when we, for example, launched... I can't remember what it was for, but we had some reason to, to shout about something in the press and it was in Screen International. And we had one of our studio patrons, Roger Corman, had given us a quote. And that was a lovely thing. You know, it made it, you know, he, that he was doing to support us. Um, basically saying Hex is great and Hex is like, you know, the, the future of this type of filmmaking. So, and that going out in the trades, meant that there were some folks that were like, hey, you know what, that, that sounds cool. I might be interested in getting involved, you know, and they would come to us. So yes, you can chase them with emails and, and whatnot, but sometimes it's better or should be complemented with these bold, strategic and assertive plans and accomplishments that mm -hmm. can actually excite people with a lot of, a lot of money, um, but also not a lot of time and they're looking for things that can really feel satisfying. Yeah, I think the trap a lot of filmmakers get into when they're trying to raise money for movies is they, they just make it all about the creative aspect of the movie. Like, hey, be excited about my movie or be excited about me, but they're not really giving them much beyond that. You know, just a, you know, a vague hope of making some money back. Well, the, the, the tricky thing is that I mean, I've always been a people person and I always think of like any indiv any investor as an individual. I talk to them. I want to understand what they would like out of the process. Mm -hmm. um, originally, bef before the commercial stuff, when I was in training, I mean, originally I trained in the arts and, and acting and all this kind of stuff. So I came from a theater arty farty background. So I could understand and sympathize with folks that have creative aspirations, but not a lot of time to fulfill them, especially those that have entered the commercial sphere, you know. I mean, I have that challenge myself. I'm an artist, but I'm also an entrepreneur and businessman. Um, mm -hmm. And so balancing that is a challenge. And for them, obviously it is. But it means I can have very honest, intellectual, personal and intimate artist-based conversations with folks like that. And those are the type of investors and patrons that work with us. So for example, um, if there was an investor that was only looking at the bottom line, then that would be much more, I'd say it would be much more challenging for us, but it's also not the type of investor we kind of seek because we always make sure the experience is right for them and we want them to be with us for years and years, not kind of like, well, 
geez, I mean, you know what most producers are like, you know, grab as much cash as they can and burn the bridges. Uh, there's a there's a big, uh, you know, a lot of filmmaker producers out here in, or in I'm not in Hollywood anymore, in uh, LA that basically, you know, that they'll raise, you know, between 500 and a million dollars for a project. They get paid out of that budget. They don't, they don't care if the movie, what it does. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Like if I meet an investor and they express an interest in the, the ethos of what we're trying to do or, um, or I've managed to get them excited about what we're trying to do, then when I'm qualifying them in terms of like, um, and they're qualifying me, of course, but like uh, when I'm <laughs> qualifying them in terms of like the kind of investment they could make, what they'd be comfortable with and everything like that, I'll tend to keep things quite conservative for them. And you were saying about some of the, the, the producers stateside, I mean, the, of course, the British producers like this as well, but their immediate qualification would be, right, how much can I get out of them? And then the conversation would be, that's not enough. If we're going to make this movie, you really need to put in all of this. It's got right. to be everything, you know, and then it's, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you um, very much. I was never able to understand that mentality, although many of uh, my professional peers, like you mentioned one film, Kids vs. Monsters, and that, Mm -hmm. Although Hex's name is on that, that was a gig, you know, like, uh, and that was a project more based on 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 that kind of model, which I didn't like, um, mm -hmm. but didn't involve any of our investors either. And it seemed to be more kind of like how some of the business was done there, you know, where every producer would happen to be a, a used yacht salesman or something. It's like, <laughs> hey, <laughs> it's like... I don't like where this upselling is going, you know. <laughs> let's let's transition uh, into a little bit of marketing talk. So, how how what's your basic approach to your marketing to marketing your company? I sometimes wonder that myself. I think <laughs> some of the success that we've had but that we've been able to repeat has been because we fell into certain practices that just happened to work. That said, though, um, Kickstarter did have a trade show in, the, in Las Vegas, and they used their company as an example of how to do a perfect Kickstarter. But apparently, we've raised the third most for any worldwide horror film or second or something, but the most in, in Europe. Um, in fact, we're like first and second, I think, in, in Europe. That was just a random boast, Jason. But to answer yes. your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I like it. I'm impressed. As, if you look at the figures, it's not as impressive. It's like, ah, oh, okay, right, uh, that's the bar, right, okay, yeah. Right. We've well, all made the most successful horror well, film in it's, Europe. It, it's, a, it's across the pond, so I make, you know, I make concessions for that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, so in terms of the marketing, well, we have a customer list that we've developed over time from all our, <laughs> this sounds pretty 101, right? But, um, mm -hmm. you know, whenever anyone buys products, we keep their email from the shop and from the Kickstarters. And right. every Kickstarter we do, as you can imagine, includes us messaging these folks kind enough to support us and encouraging them to support us again. And you just keep building because uh, maybe half the folks that have backed you before will come back again, and then you'll get half new folks. And so overall, if the total keeps going up, then touch wood, the project is something they like, then mm. you should be okay. In terms of the campaigns themselves, um, we tend to produce slick Kickstarter videos, uh, lots of really slick graphics and artwork um, with a very strong retail focus. Now that's very hard for most filmmakers because if you think mm -hmm. about it, they're making a film because they want to take it eventually to market and have another distributor sell it. Right. So it's very uncomfortable for them to be in a position where they're offering a product without even having a distribution deal. That was one of the reasons we have, we do have distribution deals like uh, with third parties to get our films out in VOD. To be honest, like that is more a result of, I've, I was always reluctant to do that because, mm -hmm. and this might sound strange, but because we were doing so well on Blu-ray and DVD special edition products, like, like so folks understand, I mean, we're talking $35 three disc multi-card sets, you know, that all fold out and look beautiful with lovely artwork. Um, yeah. Everything that goes against the wisdom of what's supposed to work in the industry right now, mm -hmm. we, we would normally go for because we'd be like, right, well, if that's considered suicidal, that's a niche. We can... <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, though, 
uh, we have enough partners in the company and folks that are like, well, you know what, Laurie, it kind of sucks a bit that we can't get these movies on Apple or whatever, you right. know, and it's like, because oh, I quite like their, quite like our Reader's Digest model, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it still is the base of us, but eventually, yeah. And so for getting our films on all the platforms, um, you know, we work with sales agents like, like Glasshouse is our sales agent for a lot of our films and, you know, um, and High Flyers in the UK is a distributor for a lot of our films. And they're, you know, they're either already on or are almost imminently appearing on, on platforms. Right. And when it comes to working with uh, distributors now, are you still, are you providing them like the, the artwork and the marketing materials or are they kind of taking that on and running with it on their end? We supply them with, materials but the thing is of course you know distributors always have in their mind what sells right especially when it comes to their expense sheet you know <laughs> <laughs> right. i know we needed this uh, five thousand dollar poster so it's yeah. shit it's like no <laughs> wait till you see the trailer oh god no um, it, it only costs six thousand dollars <laughs> but like um with the distribution deals though that we have or, 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 or sales agency deals, you know, we secured NGs though. Part of the reason we were able to do that was because we built a, you know, a number of titles, you know, before we'd eventually gone that route. So yeah. um, we had a bit of buying power, you know, or selling power, should I say. They can kind of see your track record and kind of, okay, they, they've done this, they've made this much. We can safely say, hey, we'll give you a minimum guarantee on this. Yeah, I think also it's just because it was like a deal for like three or four films, you know, like we'd, we'd mm. you know, so it was like, okay, you know, I'm fairly familiar with the film market. Like I know the players, I don't go to AFM, but I see them all at Cannes, for example. It was just a case of like, okay, right, we're going to actually cut some deals. And normally we would sometimes be looking at buying films um, that to distribute. Mm. Um, and things like that. So never selling. Um, so in any case, um, that was it really. It was like, oh, okay. You know, it was like, it wasn't a massive deal. It was like, it was, I can't say exactly what it was, but it was like a mid right. five figure deal, you know? Okay. So it was like, oh, okay, great. You know, that'll, that'll pay, the, pay the bills. And there was, you know, all the percentages and whatnot, but you don't, Call it a cynic, I, mean, I don't expect to see really anything from the royalties. I mean, that MG was like... Yeah, the MG was pretty much it, yeah. But we still preserve the right to sell our own products, so that's the key um, at worldwide as well. So that's the kind of weird, syrupy, snake-like deals that we negotiate so that we can kind of do what we're good at and still make money whilst just getting the films out there. But right. again, I'm not a big fan of it because... Well, commercially, yes, but artistically, it's a pain in the ass because our films are quite niche and they need to be marketed the right way to find the right audience. And mm. as you know, when it comes to distribution, it's like, you know, if they've bought their movie ticket, it doesn't matter if they enjoyed the movie. Right. You know, we, we, we made our money. And so you get post, you get the kind of sensational posters and stuff that might just, you know misrepresent films and whatnot and that's that's part of what you deal with if you sell the rights you know what are, have you ever done uh film festivals uh yeah so like well we had our work show at like sundance and south by southwest but mm -hmm. in terms of our feature films um they've shown uh oh let's see yeah like uh, fright fest is the biggest genre festival in the, the uk it's also one of the biggest in the world Brussels International Fantastic Film Festival, it's the biggest in Europe. They've been they've been well received, but I find festivals a mixed bag though, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, I'm not a big I'm not a big fan of festivals myself, but as far as the practicality of it, I, I think if you attack it right, it can be a good networking experience. It can be a good audience building experience. But you know, if you're going there looking for a you know a one to one, I'm going to sell my movie, it's not it's not gonna do it. And as far as promotion, I don't think it really helps anywhere else that much. No, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd agree with you. I mean, we can see the bump from showing a film at a festival. And commercially mm -hmm. speaking, it's been marginal. I don't know, maybe like 4 5% or something. You know, mm -hmm. I could um, put something together on social media and create that same bump um, right. in, in a couple of days. 
Um, the thing with festivals is because a lot of your viewers will be the, the type of filmmaker that probably aspires to have their film shown at a festival. It's yeah. like the valid validation, you know. I feel like me and Sarah broke the casino when we had Robert Redford sit and watch our short film at Sundance. It's like, well, where do you go from there? You know, it right. comes a case. Yeah, it's all downhill. Yeah, it's like <laughs> the diminishing returns, you know. I mean, those films we got covered in uh, like like Rolling Stone, uh, USA mm. Today, and I, I, I got a, a shout out as well on a, on what was it chat show Carlson Daly and stuff like that. It was like that that was wow. cool. But, that is cool. But like, it didn't mean that lots of folk were buying my DVDs, mm. you know. And then when you get to stuff like the the, the festivals, like um, the genre festivals, I mean, I'm predominantly a horror filmmaker, so it's the genre circuit. Half the time, there's technical issues. There's a lot of effort and a lot of sucking up to get your film into a festival. I mean, a, a lot of festival programmers and directors are good friends of mine that I love dearly, especially the, the Fight Fest crowd. They're like family and they've been massively supportive. But at the same mm. time, though, like for other festivals, it is like that. There's actually another festival, the Starburst International Film Festival, which is in Manchester in the UK. And it's got a really welcoming and friendly attitude, especially for Amer towards American independent filmmakers that are doing sci-fi and, and horror. I, I suggested to check them out. So it's a very warm experience going there. But most of the time, your films aren't shown right. And I'd say as well that the this might, might be controversial, but I think... I think the climate has changed a lot. Festival audiences and, and genre festival audiences before, like you go back 10 years ago, eight years ago, mm -hmm. they consisted of a lot more kind of like nerdy guys living in their mum's basement with like rows of horror VHSs and and they go out and they're just, they're kind of ha having a kind of like nerd out fun, you know? Yeah. But now I find that every... It seems that like every second audience member is like some kind of like woke blogger and mm. they're just out there to kind of like bitch or shit on what they, they, they don't like in a much louder, more kind of like antagonistic, belligerent sort of way. So yeah. most festivals, they have one out of 10 films that are like, they're amazing. They're masterpieces for whatever buttons they've, they've pushed. And then the nine out of 10 get punished. <laughs> slammed down and like we've been lucky enough like our films um fairly divisive but but fairly but popular with their niche and, and it's just enough but it just it felt like it feels like much more of a fight for filmmakers now and i actually sometimes wonder if festivals can actually do the very opposite to what a filmmaker might hope for which is mm. They've got accepted, they've been given the validation. Okay, so the programmer liked it, but then they have an audience of angry hipsters with blogs and they decide to smash your film. And then suddenly you're, you're, you're being bitched at because you didn't, because you weren't whatever they were looking for. It, it, it's like people now in, in festivals, a lot of them in, in genre festivals have this very specific idea of what they expect the film to be. And if it's not, the drop off mm. is really steep. You know, people yeah. are very angry and opinionated and it's only got more and more. And so I've actually seen folks who, uh, I've seen filmmakers, right, who my heart bleeds for. You know, yeah. they've, they've bust their credit card, they've made their first film, then they get into a big festival, like say Fight Fest, then they get totally mutilated um, by, by the audience for all time memorial on, on social media and, and blogs. And it's like, and it'll be for some stupid, some like stupid, I don't know, kind of whatever pop cultural, yeah. social just whatever kind. It'll be something political, you know. That's that's what it is. Um, and it's like that's it. They're they're like, oh, I bet they thought it was worth the the trial and tribulations of getting into a festival just so you could get to the finish line and get stabbed in the face and then be like, good luck making money on your berated film you know <laughs> in which wow. case for that guy or girl they shouldn't they should think carefully whether festivals are actually right for their film because if you're not making something that is in the mindset of these people that like to shout on their blogs that go to film festivals 
then you could do yourself a disservice and you might be better just honing and developing that audience that's right for your type of art, which is of course mm-hmm. what we've done and has been why we're successful and around. Um, how important do you think it is? And I, I know it's very important to your business model, but uh, you, so there's a lot of filmmakers that have trouble staying in, staying in a lane genre wise. You know, like like me, for example, I, my movies are all over the place uh, from comedies, family movies, horror movies. So it's been a lot harder uh, climb for me to build a, you know, a consistent audience because I'm constantly shifting genres and projects. Um, it sounds like you've been pretty like laser focused in yours. The the biggest divergencies were the were some of the freelance gigs I did, but they weren't under the hex label. I was always very conscious to try as much as possible anyway to associate myself and and hex primarily with with horror. I would mm-hmm. say that I spend ninety percent of my effort if we're talking like branding, say with genre association, with the company name rather than my own name. Mm-hmm. And um, so there'll be folks that are like. I think Laurie's a good horror director. I like his stuff, but normally they die over time and they just say, oh, I quite like Hex films. And that's because that's what I'm all about. Right. Um, I think it's partly, I'm kind of quite, um, I kind of <laughs> I kind of get a little bit embarrassed or cringe a little bit with the the, the Laurie, the horror director type kind of vibe. Right. Um, I've never been a big fan of things like, for example, auteur theory, you know, director is the principal artist. And I always believe very much in like, collaboration and, and working together with people and things like that. And it always made me feel proud when a creative team makes something. Take the way A24 market sets films, it's all very auteur based. It's like, ah, you know, Ari Aster is about to unveil his spiritual wisdom on us all with another masterpiece. You had right. to wait to, to shoot the, the witch until the, the grass was perfect for season so that it would replicate the 17 century grass that was literally in a press release a24 did that filming had to wait until the grass <laughs> was historically accurate because that's what astor demands you know that's <laughs> right. say that. so, you know, he'll be he'll be an, he'll be an awesome guy but like it, but that's but that's the that's the pinnacle of that kind of thought process in marketing and it's like mm-hmm. oh my god it just yeah it makes you sound like a total wank and yeah. also it means the people that like your films will be completely idiotically wanky because you have to be, you have to be the guy that like would only drink coffee imported from a vintage Brazilian plantation delivered by tall ship, you know, to, to be like, yeah, this is the, so I never wanted to try and be that guy. And that's the only way you can sell yourself as a genre director at the moment, I mm-hmm. think, um, is as an el- what's called elevated genre, which is yeah. this kind of pretentious nonsense. And I don't mean the films are pretentious nonsense, but just the marketing. Yes, um, I to- oh, no, I totally agree. I, I like the movies, but the the uh, perception of them and the the marketing and the uh, just the social media presence behind them is is it's maddening. The the the, the genius of um, of A twenty four basically has been to say, if you like our films, you're smart, and if yes. you don't then you're an idiot. And so people that are idiots but want to feel smart are drawn. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, and I have, I, I mean, I, could, I won't call anybody out, but I, I have some fairly close friends that like, oh, I, I love heredity and, or her, heredity or midsummer. And you, okay, well, what, what, what did you like about it? And well, uh, you know, the, the flowers were, were cool. That they, they, they don't know. They just want to be a part of that. It's really clever because like you think it's like you're marketing a product that does make people feel good whether they like the product or not it, you know it's it's a bit like how corporations at the moment like disney utilize perceptions of morality in order that people mm. feel like if you like the film you're morally more ethical and if you don't like the film then it must be because you don't agree with the ethics that they're incorporating into their film or political yeah. ethics so anyway with hex we do that but in a different way we <laughs> <laughs> hey if you're if you're smart you'll like hex if you're not no if you like beer you like hex if you like wine not so much well with hex we're, we're still trying to really hone it to be honest mm. um 
And to be honest, this this new environment of how you sell films commercially is is still is very social media driven. You know, you'll yeah. have normal distributors won't give a crap about that. You know, they're just selling hundreds and hundreds of different films. Doesn't matter. You won't even really know their names. Not even that bothered about selling their names. Um, mm. Like High Flyers is one of the biggest UK distributors, but it doesn't try to make itself um, MGM and you remember its name and you'll never forget. Maybe it will. With Hex, our audience, the audience that we like are those that have an appreciation for older cinema and a tolerance for things that would be considered in the present pop culture as uncool or campy. So for example, as an artist, I'm a romanticist. You know, I like, uh, I like to put drama and emotion at the forefront of, of our films, um, not even just in the characters, but in the elements, nature and everything. But mm -hmm. romanticism is very uncool at the moment. What's cool, cool is detachment. So you need to have a, a, hip, a hipster sitting at a diner window vaping for 20 minutes in a fixed shot with a soft electronic score and he doesn't say or do anything. And then that is supposed to express the meaningful, meaningless of grief and loss as opposed to <laughs> something eloquent and poetically written or, or you know. <laughs> so we can't get those fans, you know, but those are the loudest fans of social media. Our fans um, at the moment are probably like goths, emos and older folks and, and theatery types, narty types. Mm -hmm. um, and I love, I love them all, you know, weirdos, everything. They're, they're our bag and, you know, and, uh, and also, like, you know, we're, we're not about people having to believe a certain thing about anything from ideological to whatever to enjoy mm -hmm. our films. You know, we just, if you like older stuff and want to see it kind of brought back with a kind of neo-esque twist, then that's, that, that's, that's kind of what we're, what we, we, we try to get customer wise. And for me as a filmmaker, although I'm an ambassador for that, for Hex, talking about it. It's not mm -hmm. something that I would try to shape within my own brand. It's like, oh, yeah, so therefore watch a Laurie film. Because then I can't sell a film that isn't made by me, you know, mm -hmm. but it's made by Hex, you know, so I want Hex to be the thing. That makes sense. That makes sense. So I just have uh, one more question. Um, I ask everybody this. Uh, it's a hypothetical. Um, if I were to show up on your doorstep with uh, $50,000 or 50,000 pounds, what were you in euros there in Scotland? Oh, no, no, no. We've got pounds. Pounds. Okay, we'll go pounds. So if I showed up with uh, 50,000 uh, pounds to shoot a feature film, what kind of, uh, what? well, I'm, I'm assuming horror, but <laughs> what kind of genre would you do? And um, like, basically, how would you spread out that budget? I know you're dealing with slightly uh, higher budgets, but let's just say you had only 50 to work with. How, how would you, how would you? Uh... Well, let's see. Yeah, yeah, I do that. So I do calculations in my head. Yeah, I would probably I would probably stick with uh, limited locations, like two or three locations. You could even consider one if you find a great location. Um, Fifteen day shoot, very small crew. I would probably look at something like it'd either be a self contained horror thriller within that that location. Um, alternatively, I would even consider the much maligned uh, found footage horror genre. <laughs> I've often, you know, it's funny. Um, I've always had this perverse temptation to do a found footage film, mainly because it's such a maligned genre. Yeah. Um, there's actually a, a, there's actually a few of them that I quite like, um, mm -hmm. but it would be quite interesting to just the creative challenge of doing something where there's so much hostility towards it. See if you can make it work. Yeah. Could you do something different with that 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 can make it uh, uh, make it work? I found footage film that could allow for more production value on screen. So you've got smaller crew based on the budget and smaller overheads, but you could then put more money on front of the screen with some spectacle, maybe for the for the last act, something kind of like unexpected for a film that's normally such a, a cheap, um, you know, budget. If people want to know more about uh, Hex Films or learn more about you, where can they find you? Cool. Well, um, we have. Uh, there's hexmedia.tv it's just h-e-x media.tv that's where folks can buy goodies and we also have a YouTube channel as well called Channel Hex and um, at the moment that's kind of like a fun thing I've been doing on the side because you know mm -hmm. 
you'll, you'll be, it might be like this with yourself as well. You make films and then it's nice to be able to take a break and do some little things where you can actually finish it within a few days rather than, you know. So our channel has like some short films, interviews with like horror folks mm -hmm. um, and, and like film, I guess you could say film reviews, although they kind of tend to be parody film reviews. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, there's a number of folks that, that work with us so they all take turns doing kind of stuff it's like so channel hex is like a fun youtube channel but it's all filmmaker friendly as well there's like advice but it's like bad advice and it's genre related advice <laughs> not for your channel where it's like really good advice you know you're doing a really great thing for filmmakers actually jason you're doing an awesome thing Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I've, I've said it a few times on here, but I, I just, I know when I was coming up there, you know, which is almost 20 years ago, there were, there were no filmmakers talking about this level of filmmaking. You know, the, the only independent things you would hear about with, you know, are Tarantino or Kevin Smith. There's a whole nother level, you know, or levels of filmmakers that are working out there that are in the marketplace. And, you know, like, how, how do you do that? How do you succeed? I figure if if I can do this and help a few filmmakers just shorten the amount of time that it takes to be able to make a living, you know, it, I mean, you know, before I was making a living on just the exhibition of my films was probably 10 years into the business for me. And I, I'd like, it took me that long to, you know, kind of figure it out. And I, you know, I hope that others can do it in a shorter time. Well, you'll, you'll totally help them to achieve that. Well, Laurie, uh, thanks so much uh, uh, for your time today. And uh, I'll have you back on again soon. Hey, it'd be an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Jason. Bye. <laughs> I'm really trying to up my game here on YouTube and would really appreciate your feedback on my channel and things you'd like to see more of, things you'd like to see less of. And if you haven't, please do subscribe and hit the little bell down below. And share these videos like they were Bernie Sanders memes. But whatever you do, keep making movies.